Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. You know, it's difficult for me to imagine a teenager enlisting in the Union Army, or the Confederate Army for that matter, and yet thousands and thousands of children were in the ranks of both armies from 1861 to 1865. And it leaves me to wonder, what did the war impress upon these young men who came out of childhood experiences and school directly into the discipline of a citizen volunteer army? Well, we get a little bit of a window in that through the words of the individual pictured here. His name is Caleb Henry Barney, and he was 17 years old in 1861 when he sort of disappeared from home one day. He had been thinking about joining her for a while and had tried a couple of times, and he finally made it on this occasion and went on to serve four years first with the Rhode Island, the 5th Rhode Island Battalion, which became the 5th Rhode Island Infantry, and later on with the 14th Rhode Island Heavy Artillery, which became the 11th U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery. Four years from age 17 to 21, he left the Army in 1865 as a lieutenant, which is how you see him here. In 1880, he was still a relatively young man. He wrote about his experiences in a book called A Country Boy's First Three Months in the Army. I thought it would be a nice idea to share some passages with you from that book just to give you a sense of what it was like to be a 17-year-old. And he turned 18 not too long after he joined the Army. So we're going to get a little bit of perspective from the mind of someone who was just a kid. So the first passage I want to read to you is him after he met up with a friend of his who had joined the army and the friend was going to meet some other friends and they were all in uniform. Caleb, as I mentioned, pictured here, he hadn't enlisted yet and he was in his civilian clothes and here he meets up with this friend named Tom who is dressed in the uniform of the 5th Rhode Island. And the friend Tom is traveling down a road because it's faster than catching the train. And so the two have this conversation. It's a cold day in December of 18, uh, 1861. So here's the passage. Quote, we stood talking nearly a half hour in the moonlight, unmindful of the cold, I eagerly inquiring as to the details of his life in camp, etc., and he willingly gave me the desired information. The result of our conversation was that when we parted to go our individual ways, there was a fixed determination in my mind that another day should not pass ere my name should be enrolled as a member of the 5th Battalion, Rhode Island Infantry. I mentioned the circumstance to show how the accidental meeting with my former schoolmate finally decided the time and manner of my enlistment and changed the whole current of my life. From the first call for troops to the time which I write, I had been anxious to enlist, had twice already inscribed my name upon the enlistment roll, but each time, for lack of the parental certificate of consent, it had been removed. Now, there's a little bit of a corollary to Caleb's story. He, that next day, he joins the army. And then that night, he sleeps in a Sibley tent for his first night and begins his first full day as a soldier. Here's what happens the next day. Quote, Judge then of my dismay when, about noon of the second day in camp, I saw my father standing at the head of our company street in conversation with the lieutenant commanding our company. As I did not return home on Saturday afternoon, a search had been instituted and my whereabouts easily discovered. What passed between my father and the lieutenant I do not know. Suffice it to say, 
that perhaps thinking it best to let matters take their course, now that they had gone so far, he finally gave his consent to my enlistment and with much good advice as to the care of my health and morals, bade me Godspeed. So there you have a moment where the father, Caleb's father, realizes I'm not going to change my son's mind. He's already tried to join the army twice before. This is the third time. Maybe the third time is the charm. So that's the first passage. The second passage is an interesting moment, I think, for what kids do when they're bored. Camp life is monotonous, as soldiers often write about. And in this case, camp life was along the North Carolina coast, uh, eventually as part of the Burnside expedition. And um, he talks about what it's like to be along the coast of North Carolina in early 1862, as of now he's 18 years old. And here's what kids do. Here's what kid soldiers do. So let me begin the passage for you. Quote, the monotony of camp life on the island was relieved somewhat by the manufacture of briarwood pipes, there being an abundance of roots suitable for the purpose. Many of the men turned out articles which were very credible specimens of carving, and I suppose there was hardly a member of our battalion who did not make one or more of these pipes to send home when occasion should offer. A favorable amusement of my own, whenever I could obtain a pass, was to explore the island, searching for traces of and speculating upon the fate of that lost colony, which, as you will remember, made at Roanoke the first English settlement in America. So what do boys do? What do young people do when they're out in the wilds? They go exploring. And that's what he did. He didn't make any briarwood pipes, as far as I can see. At least he didn't, he didn't admit it, but he did go exploring the island. Now, the third passage I want to share with you is uh, the results of a battle. And what, as far as I can tell, based on my reading of his book, is his first close encounter with Confederates. And this is after the Battle of Roanoke and the capture of Roanoke and uh, the wounded Confederates are being um, taken care of. In some cases, the wounds prove mortal and these men are being buried. And one of those officers, one of the Confederate officers, you're about to meet in this passage and you're going to see the interaction from Caleb and how that played out. So here's the quote. Among the officers of the enemy was Captain O. Jennings Wise, son of General Henry A. Wise, formerly governor of Virginia. Severely wounded during the Battle of the Seventh, he died the next day and was buried by the Union troops. About a fortnight after, a small sidewheel rebel steamer bearing a flag of truce came down the sound with a request for his remains, which was granted. I happened to be detailed in charge of a squad of men which conveyed his body from the burial ground to the shore and from thence in a rowboat to the rebel steamer. The officer of the day, I cannot now remember who it was, joined us at the boat and delivered the body to the officers of the steamer. We stepped on board the rebel boats, but were allowed only on the forward deck and remained but a short time. So here's the recap. You've got this young man who is all of a sudden in command of a squad of small patrol of men. I should mention, by the way, that Caleb, though he was a kid, proved a good soldier. He was named acting corporal, got his corporal stripes, and um, was in charge of these men as they escorted the body of the son of the former governor of Virginia to a boat to be taken home to his grieving family. So the last passage I want to share with you is uh, a reference. I've never seen this before to um, Katie Brownell and students of the Civil War know Katie's role during the war. And here's a nice little description of her, an encounter with her 
at Roanoke. So here's this passage. Quote, while at Roanoke, we were joined by Second Lieutenant Levi F. Goodwin and First Sergeant Robert S. Brownell of Company A and a number of privates belonging to different companies who, from various causes, have been left behind us in Rhode Island and whom Brownell, who officiated as a sort of provost sergeant while we were at Camp Slocum, that's back in Rhode Island, have been left behind to pick up. With Sergeant Brownell came his wife, Katie, or Katie, as we called her then, one of the Vivandiers of Company H, 1st Regiment, Rhode Island, detached militia. She enjoyed the freedom of the camp in a sort of bloomer costume, more appropriate to the wilds of Roanoke than to the streets of Providence. So a great little tidbit about uh, Katie Brownell, who showed up at Roanoke Island, perhaps much to the surprise of Caleb Barney. So there you have it, some reminiscences of a young man, a 17, 18 year old kid, Caleb Barney, his first experience in the military. And as I mentioned, he was an acting corporal and wound up becoming a sergeant and later left the regiment to become an officer in the 14th Rhode Island Heavy Artillery, which was redesignated the 11th U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery. So we'll see you again on next episode. Until then, take care.